All right, well, good morning to you guys. It's so great to join you wherever you're watching in your living room. Uh, to my Every Nation GTA family, I really uh, look forward to the day that we can get together again and see one another, not just online, but in person, like Bert said. And uh, for those of you that are watching, that you're maybe not uh, part of our church from wherever you're watching, uh, in the world, in Canada, welcome. It's so great that you're able to join us be part of um, our church online service. We're going to jump in. As you just saw, a little bit of a sermon bumper video. We uh, had an amazing um, series break last week. If you didn't catch uh, Jacob Moon's testimony, I really want to encourage you to go back and look at that. Really powerful. I know it meant uh, a lot to a lot of our church family just to see and hear uh, the amazing things that God has done in his life and his family's life. But we're in part four of this series called Authentic. And so just a crash course of what we're doing is we're working through a book in the Bible called First John, written by John, uh, who was the beloved disciple of Jesus. You maybe want to say that he possibly was Jesus' BFF, his best friend. Jesus entrusted the, uh, the care of his mother to John. Uh, John was in his inner circle that, of Jesus' disciples. And so John is writing this as an old man. He's actually only one of the uh, only one of the original disciples that wasn't martyred for his faith. He's writing this towards the end of the first century. He's an old age. He's seen a lot. He's walked with Jesus. Jesus has changed his life. And he's writing to Christians and churches in a city called Ephesus, kind of like Toronto. It was an important city in that time. It was cosmopolitan, pluralistic, had lots of different beliefs. But Christianity really exploded there. And so with that explosion also came some challenges. And these particular Christians, kind of young in their faith, uh, are experiencing some challenges. There's some leaders in the church that are beginning to share a different gospel or a different message that John and some of the earlier disciples had shared. And so who do they turn to? They turn to John. And John writes them this encouraging letter. And so we're going to be jumping into chapter 2 today. But before we get there... Uh, what we've been seeing is John really circles back time and again to three things. He's all about how do we know we have an authentic faith. And he says, well, there's three tests to an authentic faith. And what we've been using is these images of a head, a heart, and a hand. What does that mean? There's the truth test or a belief test. Authentic faith means our beliefs change, particularly around the person of Jesus Christ. But it's not just all up here. Our faith needs to connect with our loves. And as we talked a couple of weeks back that uh, there's the love test, that our loves are reordered. We're ordered to love God. We're designed to love God and one another. But when we don't have that order properly, our life gets out of order, disorder. And so there's the love test. And then lastly is the hand or the life test, that our lives are changing. We're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but our lives begin to change as we look to Jesus, trust Jesus and follow Jesus. And so I want to play a little game with you quickly. If you've got your kids there, they might enjoy this. And we're going to call Spot the Difference. Are you able to spot the counterfeit from the real? We're all about being authentic. And so we have some money up there, some good old Canadian currency. I wonder if you know which one is the real one, which one is the fake one. Uh, how about uh, what do we have next? Is it a bag? How about all bags? Okay, right. Louis Vuitton. Which one is going to set you back a whole chunk of change and which one is really not going to be worth much change? Uh, do you know which is the fake, which is the real? Uh, I think the next one we have is a watch. Would you know which one is the real one? Which one is the fake one? I actually can't remember which is real and which is fake. No, I'm just kidding. So if you're really competitive like me, all the ones on the right were the real ones. And the bottom one was the fake one. The bottom of the money was the, was the fake one. So well done to you if you correct, guess that correctly. So we're all about, what's the point of that is sometimes when you're given something that's counterfeit, it really can take an expert to know the difference. You know, sometimes if we put together money, we, we really wouldn't, unless we knew specifically what we were looking for, if you got sneakers or anything that really can be knocked off, Sometimes it's very minimal and very subtle, the differences, but it makes an enormous difference in the value of that, right? You know, compare, uh, you know, a genuine Rolex watch to a fake Rolex watch, a Louis Vuitton handbag to a, a knockoff. And so it's the same thing with our faith, is John is helping us not to have a knockoff. 
And here's what he's saying. It's, it's not in the absolute stark contrast. And those are pretty obvious for us to avoid. He says, be careful because it's in the minimal, subtle shift in that, that we can follow after a counterfeit faith or even believe a counterfeit faith. And so he's going to help us in determining what is a genuine, what is a real uh, and authentic faith. Today we're going to look at a little bit what the truth test, that what we believe actually really does matter. And so join me if you can in John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, um, verses 18, and uh, we're going to read through to verses 27. It says here, children, it's the last hour, and as you've heard, that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He had made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from Him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as His anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in Him. Now, there's a lot going on in that passage, and uh, we're going to need to keep it very focused here this morning. But I wanted to start off with asking a couple of questions. The first question I want to ask is, can we know truth? You know, part of the truth test, part of the belief test, part of authentic faith is there are certain things that we must believe. Uh, to be, have an authentic faith, to be a follower of Jesus. But we live in a day and age of uh, false facts, uh, alternative facts, fake news. What's true for you, it's true for you, but it's not true for me. And so is there actually a way that we can actually discover some sort of objective uh, truth that we could latch on to? You know, I want to put up a quote from a, a, a very wise person. Lucas Maciel is one of the leaders in our church. I'll explain why I put this up. And it says this, We live in an age of chaos and confusion. It is chaos because we have an unprecedented amount of voices, options, and opinions for everything in life. Chaos doesn't arise from simply having too many voices around us, but from having all those voices equally loud. The result is a leveling of all points of view, reducing them to the level of mere taste. And since there are matters of taste, it becomes unthinkable to try to impose ours on others. Truth is reduced to opinion and fact to preference. Uh, why did I put that up here? You know, seven years ago, we, we came here to help replant a church in downtown Toronto. And in the first couple of years, as we began to see people uh, come to faith, particularly younger people come to faith, we put together a foundations course. In fact, I wrote a four-week module called Following Jesus. What are the basics of following Jesus? What does it mean to embrace the gospel and then have the gospel change your relationship with God up, change your relationship with one another, his church in, and then change your relationship with the people in the world around you out? And we did that. But what we quickly realized is we put that together assuming people believed in a thing called absolute truth, that the Bible was authoritative, that Jesus actually was who he says he was. Those were assumptions that you could have had in a Christian culture. But we're no longer in a Christian culture. And so even with people with sincere faith, they didn't necessarily know that to have an authoritative view of the Bible. And so Lucas, as we just uh, read from there today, put together a module all about discovering truth. Can we know truth? Can we believe Jesus? Can we know that this Bible is authoritative? And so I encourage you, Lucas, if you're watching, maybe what we need to do is get you uh, going with that Discover Truth module again on a Zoom or something. But it was really insightful. Don't assume that people believe in something called an absolute truth. So what I want to talk about today before we even jump into a truth test is to give you some confidence that actually there is a thing called absolute truth. There's a thing, there's an objective reality out there that you and I can then measure our reality against. 
You know, we've often used this term worldview, the way that you and I look at life and the world around us. Every one of us has a world and life view. Sometimes people are very aware of that. They've scrutinized that. They've come to uh, conclusions after reading and discovering. Majority of us subconsciously don't necessarily know that, but every single one of us has a life and worldview. There are a basic set of assumptions and beliefs that you and I have uh, that helps us look at life, interpret life, and get meaning from life. Questions like, who am I? Where do I come from? Where are we? Is this, what is this thing called Earth? And what is this solar system? Um, what's wrong with the world? What will fix the world? And then the last question is, where is history heading? Or what time is it? And so those are questions all of us fundamentally need to answer. Now, the Christian worldview is a discovery of those answers, not an invention of them. Why do we say that? Because earlier in the series, we, we discovered that God has chosen to reveal himself to us. God has made himself knowable. God desires for us to know him, the source of truth, the source of love, the source of light, and the list goes on. And he's done it in various ways. One way we say that God has given us all a general revelation of his existence. Ultimately, through creation, when we look around us, we're to see design. We see to intelligent design in creation. Also, we look within us, our conscience. We have a, almost a judge, judgment within us telling us what's right, what's wrong, what's right, what's wrong. Where does that come from? But then... Christianity says it's not just that God wants a general revelation of you as he wants us to know him very intimately and specifically. The Christian worldview says that God has done that through scripture and then ultimately, primarily, through Jesus Christ, his son, who walked like us on this earth. That is how we're able to come to know him. Jesus believed in truth. Jesus actually claimed to be the truth, not a truth, but the truth. And Jesus said that the truth will set us free. Those are bold claims. But so I wanted you to have an assurance that we can know truth and that the truth is found in a relationship with God and specifically through Jesus Christ. So we're going to ask this question, what time is it? What time is it? John in verse, uh, verse 18 says this, Children, it's the last hour. As you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Now, as much as I would love to spend the next 30 minutes or so talking about the end times, the Antichrists, we're not going to spend our time there because that's at the point that John is trying to get through. If you have any questions around end times and the Antichrist, Bert would love to answer those in our live Q&A straight after the service. So reserve those for him. But I just want to let you know, is we, we, the Hollywood is fascinated with the Antichrist. There's pockets of Christianity that seem to be obsessed with end times and the Antichrist. If you Google Antichrist, you'll probably see a list of world leaders come up on that search. Anything from the Pope to Putin to Obama to Trump and everyone in between. Honestly, as a Christian, I sometimes find this super embarrassing. I know this is part of our tribe and as Christians, we're to love one another. Sometimes some Christians make it super hard to love them when they put stupid things about, this is the Antichrist, that's the Antichrist. That's not what John is trying to get us to define. He's saying, hey, you know that it's promised in the end time the Antichrist is this, this sinister figure that's going to rise up and really oppose Christianity. He says, but instead of waiting for that, this spirit of the Antichrist is already here. There's liars and deceivers. The people that he was talking about in this, the passage of Scripture we read, they went out from us. They, it's these false teachers, these false leaders. They're trying to lead these Christians astray. And these Christians are like, who do we believe? He says, do not, do not have to look, and look in a crystal ball to find out who this big Antichrist is. It's like the spirit of lie and deception is here already. So the last hour, what are we to understand by that? You know, you think about John. He's seen the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, the fall of Jerusalem. That was huge for them. You've seen the rise of Rome and its increasingly antagonistic and anti-stance against Christians. And so for him, for him, for, for the first generation of Christians, they thought the, the return of Christ was imminent. And probably every generation since has felt the same. You know, when, when um, in the 1500s, Martin Luther, when they saw plagues around there, they, they thought, this is it. This is, this, is, this is the Lord. This is the end of the time. There's pestilence and wars. You know, think about a uh, hundred years ago. Think about how people who lived through the Second World War would have seen, looked at someone like Hitler and said, is this it? Is this the Antichrist? Is this the end of times? 
Today, even people looking, coronavirus, whatever it may be, just instability around us, this is the end time. You know, for 2,000 years, we've been living in the end times. The last I was referring to is a, is a period before the return of Christ. Now, I know for us, we want to put time and date to that period. That's what God wants us to do. But He wants us to know there's a period that we are in called the end times, or last days, or as John refers it to, last hour. I want to put up an image that I think is super simplistic, but can perhaps really help you understand what it means by this last hour. You see, when Jesus came, he wrapped up an end of an era. You know, Old Testament, all the prophecies were all speaking about this coming Messiah. And when this coming Messiah would come, he would right the world. And even Jesus' disciples thought that. And so when Jesus died, they couldn't understand how is that going to be? Because they thought it was going to be an immediate thing that Jesus would come and that Jesus would bring in and usher in this new kingdom that would bring about righteousness, no more crying, no more death, no more sickness. They didn't realize there was going to be a bit of a gap between Jesus coming and starting that and saying, hang on, fellas, I'm going away for a while, but I'm going to come back. And so we live in this weird period where that end of that age is coming to an end where Satan, sin and death and sickness triumphed. But now this new age has begun, the age to come, where Jesus has conquered Satan, sickness, sin, and death. But it's like the overlapping. This is so important to understand what time it is. Because for Christians, it means we can both lament and grieve when we see things like a virus. It's not how things are supposed to be. And at the same time, not get swept up in despair because we know that this end of that age has come and there is an age that awaits us where there will be no more death. There will be no more sickness as Jesus promised. Now, we don't know when exactly that day is going to come and we have to anticipate it like John and the first disciples did, like the church in the 10th century did, like the, the Christians of the 16th century did. Each generation anticipates and waits for that. But we're not to have a fear about the end times or antichrist, but we're not to also have a fascination, an over-fascination with them. We're to live in this period as best as we can, faithful and fruitful for the gospel's sake. You know, Jesus also said in the end time, in this period of time that we live in, not only would we see amazing things, you know, I don't know if you've ever prayed for people and they've gotten healed. I've prayed for people and they've gotten healed. I've heard testimonies of people who've gotten healed from the miraculous things. And I've also prayed for people and they haven't gotten healed. I've heard of people who have trusted God for, for things and they haven't seen it materialize. And it helps us understand that sometimes we're going to see that new creation, that new age to come materialize in front of our eyes. And sometimes we don't see that. And it's okay. We can both lament and still have hope and trust God and press in and have faith in Him to do that. But Jesus pointed out something else. He said, hey, don't be surprised. In Matthew 24, He says, see that no one leads you astray. Many, many, many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ. And they will lead many astray. So let's be faithful. Let's Look to Jesus. And so let's get into what John wants us to really focus on today in terms of the truth test. What we believe really matters. And so what deception does he point out? What deception is it that he's really concerned and really wanting to push back and make sure these Christians understand that that's to be rejected? Verse 22 gives us a, a hint at it. More than a hint. He's pretty explicit. He says, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? I love this about John. John is the beloved disciple. He's the one that really is close. Jesus BFF, if you will. But he's also very direct as well. It's it's his love comes out in very direct ways. You know, so much is at stake for John. So much is at stake for John that he doesn't want to mess around. And so he's like, hey, man, you deny Jesus is the Christ. Those are lies. You telling people that Jesus isn't the Christ. Those are lies. Deceivers. Step away from them. Uh, The spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of heresy is anything that would deny or diminish Jesus. And throughout history, this has happened. And so you might say, wow, that feels like a strong thing to say, people who deny Jesus, the Antichrist. But let's bring it home to you and me. Let's bring it home. How do we sometimes diminish Christ? Well, we diminish Christ when we say, man, he was a great teacher. Uh, He was a great prophet. He was a great example. Like if we could just live and love like him, then we would do well in this life. Those are not wrong things to say. He was an incredible teacher. He was an incredible prophet. He was an incredible moral example. But ultimately, what really got him murdered was his claim to be God. 
That's what got him murdered. What got him crucified was his claim. It was blasphemy. He claimed to be God in the flesh. And that just didn't fit the paradigm, particularly of the Jewish leaders of that day. And so we must be careful when we say things like, Jesus is my homeboy, but we don't submit to him as our Lord and our Savior. Sometimes Christians have this idea we can accept Jesus as our Savior, but he has no claim on how we live our lives. Jesus is my Savior. I get a ticket out of hell, but I live my life. And so we must be careful that that also diminishes who Jesus is in our lives. Um, I don't know if many of you know uh, uh, Rabbi Zacharias, and he just had a, a really tough blow of a, a terminal diagnosis of, of cancer. But I thought it fitting to quote him and his, some of his books. He came out of a, a Hindu background, I believe, and uh, he's gone on to help millions of people uh, really put their faith and trust in Jesus. Here's a quote. He says, all religions are not the same. All religions do not point to God. All religions do not say that all religions are the same. At the heart of every religion is an uncompromising commitment to a particular way of defining who God is or is not, and accordingly of defining life's purpose. What you believe, particularly about God, especially about Jesus, really matters. Another great quote by C.S. Lewis, probably you've heard this one before, it says, You must make your choice. Either this man, Jesus, was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. Jesus has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And so Lewis is uh, famous for uh, saying Jesus is either Lord, liar, or lunatic. You know, so or liar, lunatic, or, or Lord. He is who he says he is. And so uh, the last fundamental truth test comes from Jesus himself. In Matthew 16, he says to his disciples, and then from then on to all of us, who do you say that I am? Who do you, not what they are, who do you say, who is Jesus to you? That is the fundamental uh, truth test for us to ask today. And so in the last few minutes, I want to then go on to what then is our safeguard. If John is highlighting the importance and the detriment of just subtle shifts of denying or diminishing who Jesus is in our eyes, then what are safeguards for against deception? What are safeguards for us against believing lies? What are safeguards for us going after that counterfeit that perhaps looks like the authentic real thing? Going after that Rolex watch that really isn't a Rolex watch. He helps us with, I believe, three things, two very explicit things, one so not so much uh, explicit, but it still is there. And I believe there's three safeguards John highlights against being deceived is community, the body of Christ, uh, the word, the gospel, the, the word of Christ, and then the spirit, the spirit of Christ. Community, the body of Christ. Subtly, he says in verse 19, he says, they, these deceivers, these liars, they went out from us. They broke fellowship with us. They left the church. They left community, but they were not from us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. What's John saying is remain in healthy Christian community. Remain within the body of Christ. That means getting involved in a local expression of that, in a, in a Bible-believing, Jesus-loving, mission-focused uh, local body of Christ. There's no lone range Christians. There's no Christian. I mean, as much as we love being able to access technology in a digital world, part of being part of the body of Christ is the relationships that come with that. It's not just a relationship with a screen, not just a relationship with your favorite pastor, your favorite preacher, your favorite worship team that you can access like a buffet of Christian ministry out there. It's getting into a local expression. Why? Well, here's a recipe for cults. Cults typically will have a charismatic, a persuasive leader that has little to zero accountability. No accountability. And so it's important for us to be in relationships that will hold us accountable in a loving way. Not manipulate us. Not abuse us. I'm not talking about that. And I know there are experiences of that in parts of the body of Christ. But in Christ's body, there is a safety, a safeguard for us. Jesus has instituted that for us and john is saying these guys they've departed these men these women perhaps have departed from us and so that alone is a is a warning sign that they're no longer of us 
The second thing is, he says, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. In verse 24, what did they hear from the beginning? We could say they probably heard the gospel message. You must remember that Christianity was radical in its beginnings. Anyone could become a Christian. It didn't matter what age. It didn't matter what ethnicity you were. It didn't matter what social class you belonged to. It didn't matter what gender you were. It didn't even matter if you belonged to another religion. Anyone could become a Christian. But becoming a Christian meant that you held a certain beliefs about who Jesus was. You lived out that faith in a certain way. And so he's saying, hey, remember what we spoke to you. Remember, maybe John was one that brought the gospel to him. The gospel, the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done. But the gospel is not just the words of Jesus. In my Bible, the words of Jesus are all in red. And it's not just, hey, those are the important parts. Genesis through Revelation is all part of the word of God. And when you think of the Bible, don't think of it as a painting. We've got some beautiful paintings uh, in this basement. Not paintings, but pictures in this in this basement that uh, where we're filming from. And if you look at a painting, you're looking at that painting. The Bible's not so much a painting as it's a window. What do you do with the window? You don't look at the window pane and marvel at the window pane. The window gives you insight into something beyond it. That's what Scripture, we love Scripture, we hold Scripture highly, but Scripture is only as good as it is getting us to Jesus. It's the point that from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, it's pointing us to Jesus. And when we find Jesus, he introduces us to the Father, and he says, have you met this Holy Spirit? And so that's what we're looking at. Go back to the beginning. Hold fast to what I taught you, who Jesus is. He's not just a great teacher. He's not just a great prophet. He's not just a moral activist. not just some rebel. He's God in the flesh that came and lived amongst us for your benefit and my benefit. And then lastly, he says, the Spirit. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. Now, that last part of the sentence sounds funny. It sounds like, hey, I don't need anyone to teach me. I mean, kids, if there's any verse that you want to memorize and use on your parents, your teachers, it's John, 1 John 2 verse 27. But, like we should read, all scripture has to come in a context. I mean, the irony is John is literally teaching them and saying this, you have no need. Is John saying we don't need any, any man-made or woman-made teachers? No, he's not saying that. But what he is saying is have a confidence in the great teacher, the Holy Spirit, the one who leads us into all truth, the one who's called the Spirit of truth. He's the great teacher, the one who fir- confirms and illuminates uh, scripture up to us uses the truth of God's word and brings about a conviction in us, brings about not just dry words of ink on paper, but brings them alive. It's the word of God that becomes the living word to us. That's the Holy Spirit. And he says, remember, you were anointed with him. Anointing in the Old Testament, people, certain people were anointed for certain tasks with oil. But Jesus at his baptism doesn't get anointed with oil. Who does he get anointed with? The Holy Spirit. Guess what? As you get baptized into Jesus, who anoints you? The Holy Spirit. It's not just from some uh, a few people, some anointed men and women of God. Yes, there are people who are all called to different tasks, and those tasks require different anointings. But John's not pointing that. He's saying, you're a Christian, you follow Jesus. You have the same Holy Spirit as me that rested on Jesus, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Jesus is no longer physically with us. But he's as much a part and with us as he was through his Holy Spirit. So John's saying, here are three safeguards for you, church, young Christian. And it's the same for us today. The body of Christ, the word of Christ, the spirit of Christ. What is consistent through all those things? Jesus. It comes back to Jesus. John's getting us back to his BFF. Jesus has transformed his life. He says, it's too much at stake for you to be misdirected from Jesus or get caught up in these other things or teachings. It comes back to Jesus. Who do you say that I am? So firstly, our safeguard is in making Christ central to our lives. Secondly, our safeguard is in remaining in Christ's body, word, and spirit. All of those are necessary. When we highlight one of those to the expense of the other, that's when we experience trouble and challenges. Neglecting one of the other can also be very dangerous. We need some, some people... Elevate the word and neglect the spirit. Some people over-elevate the spirit's role and neglect the word. 
And a lot of people neglect the body of Christ because it's made up of people like you and me. But all three at least are necessary to safeguard us in the truth so that we don't get uh, deceived or led astray. You know what the result is when you make Jesus central to your lives? It's, it's a result of authentic faithfulness and fruitfulness in your life. We don't just put Jesus at the top of a priority list. We put him central to our lives and then let him speak into every aspect of our lives. We remain in Christ's body in fellowship, in community, uh, with people that hold us accountable, that love us, that care for us, that disciple us, that can speak into our lives. We go to His Word. We value His Word. We come under the authority of His Word. We return to the first things we heard. We don't have itching ears for the latest and greatest teaching, particularly if it contradicts His Word. And that we have confidence that His Spirit is not just with us, but within us leading us into all truth, that we don't grieve and neglect the Holy Spirit, we allow Him to speak into our lives. When you do that, when I do that, we're going to live a faithful and a fruitful life that's authentic and that we can have confidence that we're a follower of Jesus. I would love to pray with you today in light of that. So Father, I thank you for every person watching. God, you know where they are at uh, with you in their walk with you in their journey with you perhaps there's some people who are still yet to make you savior lord of their lives i pray today that they would answer the question jesus you say to them who do you say that i am say you are the messiah you are the christ you are the one that's the son of god that came and died for me to have relationship with you lord for many of those that are watching that are christians lord i pray that we would heed what John is saying, not just to those Christians, but to us too, God, that there are safeguards as we stay in community, in healthy Christian community. There's a safeguard as we submit our lives to your word, take your word seriously, read it, obey it, listen to it. And then, Lord, there's a safeguard when we don't grieve or neglect your Holy Spirit in our lives. And so, Holy Spirit, would you come afresh, anoint and baptize us afresh in you, in your truth, and in your body for the sake of Jesus. And may we cause, may that cause us to live authentic, faithful, and fruitful lives for your glory and our joy. Amen.